On today's episode of Homeworthy, we're taking you inside a Frank Lloyd Wright home just 35 minutes outside of New York City. It is practically in the same condition it was when Mr. Wright approved the plans almost 60 years ago. You feel as if you're stepping back in time. Enjoy this special tour. And remember to visit homeworthy.com shop to discover amazing furniture, art, and accessories handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on this channel. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hi Homeworthy, I'm Sarah, and welcome to my Frank Lloyd Wright house in the Hudson Valley. Come on in! My name is Sarah Magnus, and you are in my weekend home in Piermont, New York. This is a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who is one of the most famous American architects. The house was completed in 1959, and I am the second owner. I purchased this house about 10 years ago, and I was helping my daughter's godparents look for a house. and they had sent me the listings of all of their realtors uh, properties and this house was buried in the pages of the realtors website and i didn't believe the fact that i was actually seeing an authentic frank lloyd wright house that was perfectly intact and called the realtor and they said in fact yes this is a frank lloyd wright house it's still owned by the original owners his name was Socrates Zafiro, and within hours I was here looking at the house and made an offer, so I bought it from the original owners. This is my dog Amsterdam. He is a cardigan corgi and our ferocious guard dog. I'm now outside at the front door of the Frank Lloyd Wright house, which again is more of a Usonian style house. It incorporates the batten and the ribbon window, very traditional Frank Lloyd Wright, and also the French drains. All of Frank Lloyd Wright's homes incorporate French drains because he didn't like the aesthetic look of gutters. So when it rains, it's actually quite beautiful because the rain comes to certain points of the roof line and they fall down into these drains in different corners of the house. The gravel was selected by the original owners as well as the roof color, which is very close to the Cherokee red. The front entrance is painted in Cherokee red, which is his signature color. And the crab apple tree was planted when Frank Lloyd Wright finished the house. Is that also a signature? No, it's just more significant for the region that it's in. But the surrounding property, all the stone walls were original, actually. This used to be a farm in the 1600s, and then it was divided up and mainly remained as either farmland or parkland. And during World War II, it was the training ground for all the World War II soldiers. So welcome to my entry foyer. This is our welcoming front door area, which leads into the sunken 1950s living room, which is very unusual for many of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses for the volume and height, but most of his interiors have a progression from low to high. And uh, because of the condition of the roof being a gable roof, um, you're coming in on the low point and then we will enter and exit to the back of the house. So we are now entering into the sunken formal living room of the house and the living room is a little special in that it has one of Frank Lloyd Wright's original pieces of furniture that was designed for the house. The fabric was designed as well as the sofa. Um, the other elements were added uh, later, when I moved into the house, 
the Japanese screen um, was influential to me because I lived in Japan for four years, but Frank Lloyd Wright also had massive amounts of influence by working in Japan. And so it seemed fitting to incorporate some of my past with his. I also incorporated a lot of texture and um, color that was representative of the exterior landscape. So we're using a lot of travertine stone, textured wool, mor Moroccan rugs. Um, we have period furniture that I had reupholstered for the space and Japanese sort of decorative elements that I like and wanted to incorporate into the house. So this carpet is a Moroccan carpet. A very good friend of mine owns a carpet company, Sacco Carpet, and she and I have collaborated over almost 20 years on a variety of different carpets. And so when I bought the house, she and I collaborated and sourcing different rugs that would be perfect for the house. The living room was designed to have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. In different case study homes, uh, you could decide, almost choose what finish you wanted. You could either do wall-to-wall -wall carpet, you could do stone, you could do wood plank floors. The client had three children originally. So they were young children when he designed the house and he wanted a place where they could be a little bit rambunctious and run around. And I also have a young daughter and she loves to climb up and down the stairs. So it's worked out well over the years. I knew this house was for me the moment I drove in the driveway. I actually said to myself, I don't care what the inside looks like, I have to own this house. And once I opened the front door and met Socrates and Celeste Sofero, I knew they had been amazing caretakers of the house. So it, it was a very easy sell for me to know that I would be taking part in true American history. My career began uh, in Texas, where I'm from. I studied architecture and landscape architecture in undergrad and uh, really thought that I was going to be either in hospitality design or residential architecture. And once I finished architecture school, uh, I had an amazing mentor that encouraged me to move to New York City. And I did just that and thought I might think about interior architecture, which wasn't really prevalent in Texas. Most everything is new there. So to really study historical buildings and restore interiors uh, was something new to me. and turned my efforts into studying interior architecture at Pratt for graduate school. And once I finished schooling, I worked for some of the best in the business. Um, I worked with Deborah Burke, Christopher Maya, Benjamin Noriega, Jamie Drake, and really honed my skills and learned um, from the best. And started my business in 2010, uh, focused on residential design. And my expertise is really the fact that I can combine all elements of design together based on my background. So a lot of clients will come to me because I will focus on the landscape, I will focus on the architecture, and I will focus on the decorating to bring it all together and make it uniform and a composition for themselves. So within the living room, uh, it was a bit revolutionary during the 1950s to open up spaces and create these open environments. And Frank Lloyd Wright was really one of the first to start designing interiors that would incorporate an open plan of the dining room, living room, and kitchen area. This is the fireplace, which is one of the main focal points of the house, obviously. Every one of Frank Lloyd Wright's homes incorporate a fireplace. Um, he really understood the sensory elements of design and having a wood-burning fireplace was extremely important to incorporate through all of his houses. And it's also the great center point between the open plan of the living room, dining room, kitchen, 
um, and the exterior spaces. It's exciting to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. It's, it's more special and unique than I ever thought it would be. It's, it truly is a piece of history and I feel that I'm a part of it. And it's my job to maintain its integrity and design intent over the years. So it's, it's very special to me. So this soffit here that Frank Lloyd Wright incorporated into the design of the room was intentional because he understood the human scale and proportion. And by having this architectural element protrude and also be clad in the mahogany creates a lower space volume so that when you're seated at a table, the room feels more cozy and inviting than if it were not there at all and it would be exposed to the roof line. So the house was commissioned in 1957. Um, the style of home is a Usonian house and Frank Lloyd Wright designed three case study homes for World War II veterans. My house is case study house number one. Uh, it's the only one I know of that is a four bedroom uh, of case study house number one. And they began construction, their affordable housing uh, in 1957. The fun fact about this house was of any Frank Lloyd Wright house, the owner has to submit a site plan to Frank Lloyd Wright's office for approval before anything is started. And Socrates sent in the site plan and Mr. Wright's office rejected the opportunity to build the house. But they sent a note also explaining if they have the adjacent lot, then Mr. Wright will consider building the house. So Socrates went to the town and they had recently rezoned the area for the state park and sold the adjacent lot to Socrates. And that is how the driveway came to be, which is all about how the house is sited and how you, you know, make your progression into the landscape and separation, which is much of Frank Lloyd Wright's philosophy. And once the house was built, it was completed in 1959. Unfortunately, Frank Lloyd Wright passed away in the middle of construction and the project architect from his office who was working on the Guggenheim in Manhattan finished the house. So now we're going to take a walk outside and this is the rear yard of the house. All of the doors and windows are original. They were made by Pella Windows and Doors, which is still an American-made company and family-owned, which is amazing that we can still have American-made companies that are family-owned and be able to still maintain the original windows and doors of the house. And it's great because Pella has come to see them. The outside of the house I completely restored um, in the last five years. Um, it had been painted many times over the years and I thought it was important to bring back the original colors of the house. When I, we did the restoration, there were about seven layers of paint and I had a great restorer who came to the house and as we chipped away, found the original base color of the house and then accented based on Frank Lloyd Wright's color palette uh, the accent color for the windows and the muttons on um, the bedroom sides of the house. The intention of the colors was that it would blend in with the landscape and most of Frank Lloyd Wright's homes have a very natural color palette based on the location and demographic of the setting of where the house is. So if you're in Arizona, it's a very different color palette than in New York State. Um, but the one color that remains true in all of Frank Lloyd Wright's homes are the Cherokee Red. And there are different elements within the house that I wanted to maintain the Cherokee Red. Um, the patios on the outside, entrance and exterior are the Cherokee Red. And then some of the furniture on the exterior I had painted the same color. But these four trees are 
cherry blossoms. They're Japanese cherry blossoms. And because Frank Lloyd Wright was so particular about design and controlling all aspects of the house, he also incorporated some of the tree species that would be part of the house. So this cryptomeria behind me, the four cherry blossoms here, the Japanese maple that's on the backyard and the front are all purposely placed and planted and original um, to the house. So I purchased the house in 2014 and I knew how special it was. I knew that I was a proprietor of this house. Um, I knew there would be more after me to also take care of the house as, their, as the caretaker. I changed nothing and it, it wasn't difficult to do. It's not a house that you want to live in probably every day, but it's, it's definitely a special house in knowing that there's so much history and legacy to protect. We are now in the kitchen of the house, which is also a very revolutionary idea for 1950s design. It's a very large kitchen for that period, but it also opens up into a breakfast room, the dining room, and the mudroom. The kitchen is a very traditional Frank Lloyd Wright kitchen. It incorporates all of the modern amenities of the 1950s with the exclusion of the new refrigerator and dishwasher, but it has the original Formica countertops in classic Cherokee red. The floor is original linoleum, also in Cherokee red, and all of the millwork was designed using the mahogany um, stain that Frank Lloyd Wright loved. What's really fascinating to me about the kitchen is that if anyone had ever been to Taliesin West in Arizona, you would see the thought process and progression of Frank Lloyd Wright's experimentation for creating these case study homes. And so all of the design of each cabinet was originally an experiment within his own laboratory in Scottsdale, Arizona. So it was really special for me to go there and visit and see how his ideas were formulated and then implemented later. The decorating of this house took a little bit of time, longer than probably if I were a client of myself, but it's a little bit of the shoemaker's kids um, because I do this for a living. But I knew that there were elements of things that I wanted to recreate and bring back into the house that were here originally. Um, the sofa I'm sitting on is original. Uh, this was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The fabric was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright's office. Um, so this will remain with the house always. The rugs were hand selected um, for different reasons um, based on the color palettes and texture of the room that I was using them in. Um, I wanted to use a lot of natural materials, so marbles and stones and wools um, were used throughout the house. And the color is really reflective of nature. This is the original floor plan of the house. As I said before, this is a four bedroom house. Uh, it's the only one that is still intact uh, of the case study houses. So I am opening the original drawings of the house. Um, there are different details, which are fascinating because they also have the notations from the project architect when he made site visits to modify or change any elements of the house that didn't work from the design room. This one that we're looking at is actually the details for the fireplace, which is really fun um, to know that that was there. And this is the basement. <laughs> and this is the joist and wall system for the house. So if I have to change anything, I know where to go.
So the quirks of this house are that you're living in 1959. <laughs> you have to accept the fact that you're sort of in a time capsule a little bit. But to be honest, after living here a decade, um, everything works the way it needs to work. You can take you know, hot showers and use your oven and you have a dishwasher, all of the modern amenities. It's just a little bit more simplistic in the sense of how things are decorated. But to me, that's what makes it so charming. When I moved into the house, I got a lot of comments about remodeling. It's what I do for a living. Um, it takes a bit of restraint to understand what needs to remain and what needs to go. Everything was in pretty much mint condition when I moved in. So it truly was meant almost in a way it had a sort of spirit to tell me that it needed to remain as is. And knowing now, having lived here almost a decade, I'm really glad I changed nothing. Because once you appreciate the original design and understand the intention and how it's meant to be used, you can acclimate yourself to it. So yes, I am all about renovation and restoration, but in a house like this, it was meant to be the exact same way it was built originally. Again, Frank Lloyd Wright's new contemporary living was that he wanted to create conversation within the kitchen. He understood how important kitchens were to many American families, and he was the one to implement the range being on the center island, which was, again, a 1950s new technology, new innovation on how American families would live and entertain. And so he also incorporated this pot rack um, with the request of the original owner because he was the pastry chef at the Plaza Hotel. He loved to cook. and. Uh, the kitchen was very important to him. My favorite thing about this house is that in each season, it represents a new experience. Each season brings a different way to use the house. And then in the winter, we have a roaring fire, the Christmas tree is lit, and the summer, again, all of the exterior trees are full bloomed and we can ha hang out on our hammock. My daughter can swing on her swing. And in the spring, the most special time I think of the year is the cherry blossoms in May. And we spend an entire week outside under the cherry blossoms hosting barbecues because I'm Texan <laughs> and entertaining the within the house. Now we are walking into the breakfast room, which is one of my favorite rooms of the house because of all the natural sunlight. Um, the beauty of this space is that it's a double high space. Again, this is another architectural element that Frank Lloyd Wright included by lowering the soffit over the kitchen and then raising it up with the ribbon windows on the exterior. And this is a room I never turn the lights on. <laughs> I love watching the seasons change. We sit on the sofa and read. My daughter does her homework. Um, we entertain. It's, it's a space that truly is captivating and is very special. I bought the house intentionally because it was surrounded by a park. I live in New York City. My life is full of noise and not chaos, but action. <laughs> and I really wanted a quiet, peaceful retreat from New York. And this house is only 30 minutes away, which is amazing. And it is surrounded by a New York State Park on all sides except for my one neighbor, who I never see, but uh, is camouflaged as well. But it's, it's a great, quiet escape from New York. We are now walking down the hallway, which connects all of the bedrooms and the bathrooms to the bedrooms. It also includes the original accordion doors. There are no swing doors. Every door in the house is the original accordion door. And along the hallway, Frank Lloyd Wright 
incorporated a lot of built-in mill work, which he does on all of his properties and houses because he didn't like clutter. <laughs> and so my house, I have a lot of books and intentionally we are using all the storage for books and linens and clothing that we cannot put into the rooms. So this is one of the accordion doors and it's very easy to operate. You open and close. And the entire wall is paneled in mahogany with a batten piece that, again, he studied within his laboratory in Scottsdale. Um, his bathroom in Scottsdale, ironically, is all clad in stainless steel, but this design. So it's a little strange if you've ever been there to see. Um, I prefer the wood than the stainless. This is one of the secondary bathrooms. Again, 100% original. We've changed nothing. All of the original plumbing fixtures are the same. Um, it's from an American company called Crane. Um, I actually had to replace one piece uh, and the only place to get it is in this little town in California. So <laughs> if you ever need authentic Frank Lloyd Wright plumbing fixtures, let me know. I know who to call. But all the original lighting, the vanities, the tile, this is a dowel tile, uh, standard American uh, brown that they used during that period, which I still actually love. I thought originally I might remodel the bathrooms, but I've come to love them and appreciate them for what they are. Do you ever feel like you're living in Mad Men? <laughs> the house is definitely 1950s. It's, you know, I love the show Mad Men, but it's, it's something, again, you want to just embrace and, and understand that it was that period of time. So I have now embraced it and appreciate it. We are now in my bedroom, which is the main bedroom of the house. And it is really special because you're elevated to the mid-level of the tree canopies outside. And Again, during the seasons, you have a different experience of each morning when you wake up. But it's also really special because the room is completely clad in mahogany. And it's also the only room in the house that incorporates the roof line completely. So the volume itself is very special. I don't have it largely decorated with many items. Um, a lot of the items are authentic and personal to me. The quilt on the bed is made by Fortuny. A very good friend of mine who owns Fortuny is very interested in Japanese textiles and so we commissioned this quilt and pillow uh, for the house. The rug was designed with Sacco carpet for the room. It's all indigo dyed cotton which is very similar to a lot of Japanese techniques that were used. Some period furniture. I like mixing furniture pieces. I don't think you need to live in a museum per se. So all of the elements of the room are personal to me. I have the Tansu chests as my bedside tables. And the Japanese screen is very special to me because of the horses running through the field. It's also unusual to have the blue and the horses within a Japanese screen. One of the decorative elements that I love uh, throughout the house that I use are these Japanese stencils. And what's amazing is each one is hand cut and designed. They were used mainly at the turn of the century. And I thought they have such a beautiful patina for the patterns that I would frame them. And each side has a little bit of a unique color and having the light come through just makes them even more special. So the stencils were used for various patterns on fabrics. They were used for kimonos, uh, wallpaper, and each factory that were producing each stencil, they would make it for that season and then they would throw them out. So there are different dealers throughout the world that collect these stencils and most of the time they're not really utilized and in a way where you could really visualize them. So I thought it would be fun to frame them. We are now walking into my bathroom. It is also completely 100% original. It's the original brown dowel tile and a one and a half inch 
square. What's also great is Frank Lloyd Wright incorporated this ledge, which again, he really was controlling on how much storage you could have. Um, but the light is original, the vanity is original, and there's a little shower on the other side of the wall here. Having a home is a very special asset to each person. A home can be defined by many different places, many different sizes. And I think the most important part of home is that you feel comfortable, you feel welcome, and you feel warm. Thanks for watching. For more homeworthy content, be sure to like and subscribe.